Hello. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Misha Leibovich. I'm a fourth year engineering physics major here in the College of Engineering, and it's my pleasure to be serving this year as AHUC president. Uh, my, my folks are uh, Russian immigrants. I love Cal very much, and I was born in the very wonderful and proud city of St. Louis, Missouri. Very, very resilient, resilient and proud city. The, uh, um, I'd like to introduce to you the Dean of the College of Engineering, Dean Richard Newton. Now, um, when I was preparing to uh, give the intro for him, I was doing some research. Uh, I Googled uh, his name, so I should really start using the, the calbearsearch.com. It helps our athletic program. Um, but I typed in Dean Richard Newton, and so I, I found some stuff about the speaker, but a lot of stuff comes up about uh, Richard Dean Anderson of MacGyver fame, um, Sir Isaac Newton of Falling Apples fame, and uh, Howard Dean of uh, Passionate Speeches uh, fame. And uh, so, so after, after watching some old MacGyver episodes, I, I found some, uh, some great information about our next speaker. He is a native of Melbourne, Australia. Contrary to popular belief, he did not have a pet koala growing up, but uh, he became a closet fan of Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. Um, he came to Cal in the 1970s to earn his Ph.D. in electrical engineering and joined the faculty in 1979, where he was very popular with the students. I was brought him apples and stuff. Um, in addition to a distinguished academic career, including being appointed to the National Academy of Engineering, the dean has found, found, founded um, several successful Silicon Valley companies and serves today on a range of corporate boards. From my personal experience, he's very approachable and extremely dedicated to students, faculty, staff, alumni, keeping Berkeley on top. It's one heck of a good-looking guy. Uh, pl 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 please join me in, uh, in welcoming a man with the ingenuity of MacGyver, the uh, passion of Howard Dean, and the brilliance of Isaac Newton, Dean Richard Newton. Thanks. That was great. Thanks a lot. So now I've got something to live up to. So. <laughs> Uh, President Dines, Chancellor and Mrs. Bergenau, Chancellor and Mr. Thomas and Kesey, distinguished guests, friends of the college, colleagues, welcome to this very important event in the history of our very special institute, Citrus. Citrus, as you know, or most of you know, I hope, is one of California's four California Institutes for Science and Innovation, and uh, it is designed to engage with the students, the faculty, the staff, and the state to help us keep California's economy on top and to produce the leaders that we need to carry us well into the 21st century. These institutes were started about four years ago now, although Citrus actually started a little later, about three years ago. We, we, were, we were the fourth of three uh, of these institutes. Um, and. Uh, and so we've been going at this now for about uh, three years, and it is a, an incredibly important milestone for us to be able to break ground on what ultimately will be the headquarters building for this very important institute. Now, Citrus is a simple word, but it has a very complex interpretation. It's the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interests of Society. Yes, it's focused on information technology research, but the real theme and the real motivation behind Citrus was the recognition of the faculty on four of our UC campuses that in the interest of society was critically important to us at this time in the evolution of our, of our community and our planet. These faculty got together prior to the awarding of this institute and designed a research agenda that was centered around the notion of doing the research needed to improve the quality of people's lives in California, in the United States, and throughout the world. This was critically important to the faculty and the students that put this uh, uh, institute together, and you'll see some of the results of that as I get into it. Um, as Dean of the College of Engineering, I'd like to begin by especially thanking um, our alumni, the friends of the college that have supported us, our dedicated trustees from the Berkeley Foundation, many of whom are here today, your help in many, many ways, making phone calls when we needed them uh, the most, uh, were critically important to moving this particular endeavor through the political landmines that we had at that time in, in the history of the state. I would also like to acknowledge and thank all of our industrial partners. We have many industrial partners. I'll come to that in a second. But uh, they have also been critical, not only in supporting the research, 
but also in promoting the importance of the university and, frankly, of this particular mission. When we started Citrus, this idea of technology in the interest of society was actually a very strange one for a lot of people. It was in the middle of the dot-com boom. People were talking about Silicon Valley and how the Internet was going to change the world. People were investing in, in high technology companies and it looked like that was never going to stop. So the notion of actually working on things that are involved in areas like transportation, healthcare, etc., were not really the center of the world. Then came the energy crisis in California. And, of course, we always had energy on our list here for Citrus, but we moved it to the top of the list when that happened. Then came 9-11, disaster management, disaster mitigation, detecting the possibility of, of uh, problems like that was always on our agenda, but that also moved up in priority. And we've seen now that throughout the United States, frankly, throughout the world, using technology to improve the quality of lives for people, to protect people, to to improve the economies through technology has become a real priority for, for many, many other institutions, not only here in the United States, but throughout the world. Now, before I get into the details, I'd like to first uh, uh, acknowledge a few very special people. Rujna Baichi is, where's Rujna? Just stepped out. Okay, Rujna is the director of our Citrus Institute. Um, Jim Demmel, our chief scientist. Gary Baldwin, the associate director of Citrus. Um, these people have absolutely dedicated themselves over the last three years to getting this institute going, and I, and I really thank them very much for all that they've done. I'd also like to thank Jeff Wright, who is here. Is Pat Manti here? Pat's not here. Pat was coming. Pat's the director at Santa Cruz. Jeff is the director at UC Merced of Citrus. And, of course, the, the fourth campus is UC Davis, where Ben Yu has, has been uh, uh, leading the charge for us. Now, this morning, those of you who were at the, at the trustees meeting heard Jay Kiesling talk about the importance of technology and its use in improving the quality of lives of people throughout the world. The Citrus faculty have focused their spotlight on this particular endeavor for the last four years, and it's been a, a large part of what uh, Citrus is about. So Citrus's mission is inventing and then applying, through demonstrations, information and communication technologies to the solution of large-scale societal grand challenge problems, and some of the problems that we've been tackling are listed there on the left. Energy, health care, the environment, transportation, education, cultural issues in the humanities and the social sciences and disaster response and homeland defense. But frankly, over the last three years, the research agenda has blossomed much more broadly than our initial um, vision for the Institute. As I mentioned, there are four UC campuses that partner in this endeavor, Berkeley, Davis, Merced, and Santa Cruz. Like said, being our newest campus um, in the system here, and we're very proud of that partnership and the work that we've been doing there. The Citrus headquarters building is here at Berkeley because a large part of the research effort currently is, is centered here at Berkeley. Uh, that mix, of course, changes over time with different uh, faculty participating at different levels, but the Citrus headquarters building is, is replacing our old Davis Hall, and uh, we'll get to that in a minute. There are a number of things that are really important about Citrus. It's a new model for industrial collaboration that we're pioneering here in the Institute. Private support was critical to securing the state's commitment of $100 million towards capital projects, towards buildings. We had to find a two-to-one match in funding. So we had to commit that for every dollar the state would give to the university for this particular project, we would find two to uh, complement that. And while the state's commitment was primarily for, in fact, almost entirely for a building or buildings, the money that we were able to secure has mostly, almost all of it, been focused on, uh, on the education and research missions of the university. It's a multidisciplinary institute, and I'll, I'll just explain this in a little bit more de detail shortly, but the idea of Citrus is to connect, as Chancellor Bergeron as mentioned last night and again this morning, this notion of connecting, taking advantage of the strengths across our campus as well as among our campuses and bringing those together is a critical element of the model that Citrus is trying to promote here at Berkeley and on our uh, partner campuses. And right now there are more than 150 uh, faculty in 50 plus departments distributed across these campuses that are collaborating on the research that uh, Citrus is undertaking. We say maximizing the impact of our education and research is the primary goal of the Citrus Institute. I mentioned our corporate partners. There are 
11 founding corporate partners for Citrus, and these names I'm sure are familiar to all of you. Again, I'd like to thank, there are many representatives here from our um, founding corporate partners. They work very, very closely with us, not only on the research, but also helping us think through our research mission and make sure that the connections are made with uh, industry. Um, especially like to thank Uli Ramaka, who's here today, uh, Director of Research at Infineon, for coming over here. Uh, and uh, our relationship with Infineon, as well as ST Microelectronics in Europe, has been a very important one to us uh, in this endeavor. These companies collectively have committed $60 million to uh, Citrus over a four to five year period. We have associate corporate partners. Again, many names you recognize. These are companies that have been involved in the research at a lower level of commitment and activity, typically not involving as many people uh, in the research either, but certainly critical to the future. And these are all of the smaller companies that are currently actively involved in Citrus Research on one of our four campus, uh, cam campuses. When we started, it was a small core group of founding corporate partners. It has blossomed significantly since then. Now, I mentioned the match. It's always good to show you how we've been doing. We track this very carefully. Um, as I said, we started a little later than the other institutes. We're three and a half years into our uh, program, and we committed $200 million over four years in terms of match. I'm proud to say we have uh, secured $250 million of match already. So we've, we've beaten the requirement by $50 million. Now, what's also interesting about this particular diagram is it shows that the funds that we've received here on the campus from the federal government through grants and contracts that have been competed for by our four campuses and the faculty that are involved in these projects leverages the industrial money that we've collected to date by four to one. So it's a good investment. So the industries in California and our other corporate partners, for every dollar they invest in research here, we spend five dollars. And that, for them, is a very, very good deal. As I sometimes say, institutes like Citrus, QB3, the others, are becoming what I like to call the demilitarized zone of research. It's a place where companies can come, work in the open. All of the work we're doing here, by the way, is open to anyone who is interested in, in, in working with it or taking it and turning it into a, a new uh, company or a new product or service. It's not limited. There's no uh, uh, tight control over the intellectual property at all. But we are the melting pot. We're the commons for where these companies can come, the universities can collaborate, and that's been critical to Citrus. And from my point of view, a really important role, certainly for me as dean here in the, in the College of Engineering at Berkeley. Now, I thought what I'd do is take you through very quickly one endeavor we started. In fact, this one was started, started the idea for it was started a little bit before Citrus began, about a year before. One of our young faculty, Chris Piester, uh, Carl Piester's son, I think Carl's here today, um, came up with this idea of smart dust. His idea was, can we make electronics sufficiently small and requiring sufficiently low power that a, a device that could sense and relay information could be smaller than a cubic millimeter and could we wirelessly convey that information so we could build networks of these devices and they could be used in a whole variety of interesting applications and I'll come to that in a minute. When we started in February 2000, the um, smart dust looked like this. It was sort of more like smart rocks. <laughs> but one of the things we believe in here is actually building things, trying them out, and then cost reducing them. By February 2001, our mechanical engineering department become involved. Uh, faculty at, at, in particular at, down at uh, UC Santa Cruz had become involved. And uh, uh, we were in the business of making these containers smaller and, and more efficient. With the help of one of our partners, Intel, David Tennant House, I believe, is here, uh, the uh, uh, Vice President of Research there. We developed an even smaller version of this. And what's that noise? Why do you hear that? So it turns out if you reach under the seat, um, you may find something there. So some of you will find, if you, have, if, you, if you can find something, hold it up in the air so people can see you found it. Okay? All right. So could we change the screen, if you wouldn't mind? What we see here, we have 12 of our smart dust nodes out there in the audience. They're represented here. And what they're doing is they're beeping. We just turned them on, and they're trying to find one another. And as they find one another and they connect and form a network, you will see green lines showing up, showing the paths of those networks between those green 
uh, uh, smart, smart customers and so on. Now, as they connect, they're starting to communicate and collaborate. And the two things that smart dust have to do is they have to sort of form a reference in time and in space. They have to work out where they are and they have to work out when they are so they can compute. And that beeping sound, which sounded fairly random, fairly soon will turn into a consistent beep as they compare their time clocks and synchronize themselves to one another. When you see a, a dashed line like that, it means that one of the nodes can't talk directly to the hub down here, but has to actually talk to another node and then to the hub. They're forming this network in an ad hoc, random way as they do their computing. Now that number up there on the left, that zero percent you see, is how many of them can actually see light. They all have a light sensor on them. So if you're holding yours, uh, you'll see that as we turn that on, right now 23 percent of them are actually believe they're in daylight and the rest believe that someone's got their hand over the top of them or, or doing something else with them. So you can see the power of this technology. It's self-organizing. It can compute. It computes not as an individual node, but it forms a collective. It's the collection of nodes that are relevant here. And this is an entirely new paradigm for computation. And Dado, all we need is a GPS chip in each of these. And, uh, and they'd, be, they'd be perfect. They'd know exactly where they are in the, ro in the room as well. So now they're starting to synchronize. You can hear that. Now, in February 2002, we got all the electronics for that system down um, into, uh, into a chip uh, that size with the help of a partner, National Semiconductor. Um, February 2003, we were down to that size. And our goal is to get these dust motes down to this size. This, this is not a real one. These are actually RFID tags. But that's our goal, and that's the D in the word God on that penny up there. Letter D. So that's our goal. When we can get them that small, we can make them self-powering. We have research you'll see later where they scavenge energy from their environment, heat, light, vibration. They power themselves. We could take these chips, we could put them in a bucket of paint, we could paint them on the wall, and they'd start computing. That's the ultimate goal in terms of the technology push for this now, there, nothing works nowadays without software, and uh, David Culler, who's here helping us, uh, shown there, this is at the Intel Berkeley lab. Intel actually formed a lab here at Berkeley to collaborate with us in this uh, Citrus endeavor, developed what has now become an international standard operating system for smart dust. There are over 30,000 copies of his software that have been downloaded from our website. There are major test beds of smart dust now at MIT, Harvard, UCLA, and of course here at Berkeley, and this summer, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, is funding the construction of a 10,000 node version of what you just saw to see what happens when we have that large number of sensors. What are we using it for? Well, faculty here at Berkeley and at our partner institutions have used this in a number of ways. We went to Japan. We sent a team to Japan to look at the liquefaction of some ground. We've got all sorts of projects going on up in the Central Valley in terms of monitoring for earthquakes and the potential of earthquakes. We're retrofitting buildings to look at the effects of seismic uh, uh, movement and whether buildings would be safe after a seismic event. You'll see later out in, the, in, the, in our demonstrations the use of smart dust in fire monitoring equipment and ways of helping firefighters know where they are in very dangerous situations and a lot of smoke. They've been used to measure the microclimates on, on redwoods here in the botanical garden. The botanists are getting data that they've never, ever been able to get before, and it's changing the way they see their research in terms of, of uh, trees and, and vegetation. Uh, we've wired the Golden Gate Bridge. When you drive over it, our smart dust is there monitoring the movement of the bridge and uh, relaying back to us information. It's interesting to note that the top of the bridge moves about 20 feet in a strong wind. We've been able to measure that. Um, we're, we're have been over in China working on the preservation of uh, the Mogao Caves in Israel, helping them with um, Masada and Teleactors is another demonstration you'll, you'll see out here uh, after this um, uh, brief introduction. The point here is that it's not just about the technology development, it's about the interaction of that technology development with all of these kinds of applications and that drives the technology development in a virtuous cycle towards things that people actually want to use. The result is we've created now a community over the last four years here at Berkeley. These are all Berkeley faculty that happened, I, I have this, I apologize to our partner institutions, but I happen to have this particular slide handy. Um, and um, 
There are, of course, many people, at, uh, particularly at Santa Cruz and Davis, not so much at Merced yet, but uh, that are also working on this, and Pat Manti is one of the keys. These are all EECS faculty. These are all people working on various aspects of privacy, security, in the technological sense, and these are all faculty from other units. Praveen is an ECS person, but he's working on an application in transportation. And they are, in fact, uh, uh, looking at the legal aspects and, and some of the other aspects of this technology that become important when you can sense and distribute information. Again, the activity is distributed across the various campuses and certainly across the various units. Not only that, the technology, Crossbow, a company down in Silicon Valley, has produced now 50,000 of these dust moats. Half of them have gone to universities, half of them have gone to startup companies. Um, dust Networks, Chris Pistra's company, has spun out and he's uh, actively developing new technologies in this area. And there are a whole lot of companies that have developed um, since then and uh, are all taking advantage of this technology that we've placed out there in the public domain for everybody to use and develop. Of course, we've got a lot of press as a result of this, which has been great in terms of feedback. Um, that has caused the analysts to become interested in this area, and they've now chosen this direction, this particular technology as something that they think will turn into a major industry in the relatively near future. Of course, now most of the activity has been focused around the research applications, but their view is that these particular areas will be next followed by industrial monitoring, electric power and utilities. And by the way, we have a very large citrus project working with the California um, uh, authorities on, on uh, the power management uh, as aspects of smart dust and how it can be used, and then eventually into consumer and automotive markets. Of course, these uh, analysts, and there are, there are a number of companies, there are about eight reports I've counted from the financial sector where they've looked at where this industry is going, and Dad, I'm not sure we totally believe these numbers, but they say that that by 2008, the highest estimate is there will be 160 million smart dust units shipped. Uh, the lowest estimate is about 60 million. And the estimate is that this industry will be somewhere between a billion and $2.5 billion by 2008 in terms of its value to California uh, and ultimately to the world. Starting five years ago with an idea that one of the faculty had about building something tiny and seeing what you could do with it. It's the power of the collaboration, the connections, that ultimately leads to these sorts of outcomes, and this is what Citrus is all about. Now, I say it's multidisciplinary, but how are we doing that? What's going on there? First, let me show you the distribution of faculty involved in Citrus by discipline. It's about information technology, so you'd expect that about half of the faculty would currently be from the electrical engineering and computer science disciplines on our four campuses, and they are. But 17%, roughly 20% are from other engineering disciplines. A lot of the projects that you saw in the civil engineering area and the mechanical engineering area represent those particular faculty. We have about 20% of our faculty in other science areas. There are some really interesting applications, not only of this technology, but of course this is one of, of 50 or 100 projects going on within Citrus, but in the nano area, in the synthetic biology work, uh, that you heard about uh, this morning by Jay Kiesling is actively, we're actively collaborating in that work as well. But equally importantly is the relationship we are developing and it's taking some time, but, but it's a very important one and Rujan is nodding, I, I, she, this is one she's dedicated a lot of her time and energy to in connecting in with the humanities, the social sciences and law. Now, you know, it's all very well to say let's collaborate, but when you actually get Together, what do you do and how do you do it? And I'm going to give you one quick example of how we make that work and why we think this is a very, very special institute. There's a book, a very small book, I recommend it if you haven't had a chance to read it, that uh, uh, came out some time ago now called Pasteur's Quadrant, uh, written by Donald Stokes. And he says when you think about basic research and you think about how it moves through to ultimately to products and services that people buy uh, and consume, it's not a linear process, and in fact, there are two factors you have to consider when you organize that activity. The first thing is, are you, as someone who's working in this area, interested in fundamental understanding? Is that important to you or not? Do you care why something works and how it works, not just what it does? The other question that's orthogonal to that is, are you interested in whether what you do is usable by someone or not? And that's obviously another important question that needs to be answered you might decide, no, I'm not. I'm interested only in the research for the sake of it. And if you do, then that's Bohr's quadrant, quantum mechanics. 
Okay? I'm interested in fundamental understanding, but frankly, I'm only interested in the fundamental understanding. Now, if you're only interested in application of what you do and you don't really care about the fundamental understanding, that's called Edison's quadrant. When he invented the filament for the light bulb, he just tried everything he could until he found one that worked and he shipped it. He didn't particularly care about understanding how it worked or why it worked. But this quadrant up here is the important one for us, and this is Pasteur's quadrant. Pasteur was really interested in fundamental understanding. That's what motivated him. That's what motivates us here at a university. But he was also interested in his research having utility in some way, shape, or form. And we call that, Stokes calls it, we, use, we borrow the term, use-inspired basic research. Now, it's not about applications. We're not doing applications. We're inspired by a use, but we're focusing on the fundamental research needed to make that use possible. Our industrial partners then pick that work up, as you saw in that previous example, and take it to the marketplace and turn it into industries. Again, we're not interested in killer dollar licensing of technology. We're interested in founding billion dollar industries. That's the goal of this institute. Now, the example I'm going to use is also from the medical area. It's, it's, it's a different disease than some of you heard about this morning, malaria. It's called dengue fever. It affects many millions of people on the planet every year. Um, if you get it the first time, you may not even know you have it. And that's part of the problem, detecting the presence of the virus in your blood supply. If you get it twice, you probably die. So it's really good to know that you've had it the first time. <laughs> the problem is the way that you do that is you test a sample of blood and in the developing world, which is mostly where this disease is found, um, notice that there is a small part of the United States that is at great risk for this disease as well, there in the, uh, in the southeast. Um, the actual blood test can take as much as two weeks, and by that time the disease has moved. It's an airborne disease. It's, 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 it's borne by uh, mosquitoes as well, like malaria, and it's a major, major problem. Now, a few of our students working with Professor Bernard Boser uh, in the MEMS area, the micro-electromechanical systems area, making micro-mechanical systems on top of silicon chips, things that move, they were really interested, inspired by this idea of use-inspired basic research. They probably didn't know it as that at the time, but um, that's clearly where the influence came from. And they became interested in trying to address one of these critical problems. And they went over to the School of Public Health. They found a receptor, Professor Eva Harris over there, who was interested in this particular problem. They said, well, let's see if we can collaborate on this. They brought in people from molecular and cell biology, from integrative biology, and they put together a team to tackle the rapid detection and uh, assimilation of the information related to the presence of dengue fever in a blood sample. The result of that was that um, they created this uh, small device down here, which, when you put a drop of blood in there, uses a very sophisticated lock and key magnetic mechanism that was invented by these researchers in electrical engineering to detect the presence of an antibody to that dengue fever virus. Once it's detected that, then the work that we did on Smart Dust is used to convey that information back to a central site where that information can very quickly be assimilated and you can look at the spread of this disease as it moves through a community. Now, one of our semiconductor partners, National Semiconductor, decided, well, if that's a nice chip to build, it's a consumable, they're going to use a lot of them, so they were interested in helping us with uh, the manufacture of that. One of those students has, uh, of, uh, of Bernard's has moved on to the Whitehead Institute and is working there, and um, Turgut will be, in fact, outside if you want to talk to him about this project uh, after we finish here. Uh, but this is the team, Acumen Foundation, uh, who is, in fact, interested in transferring the technology to low-cost manufacture for the developing world, uh, and, uh, and faculty from Berkeley, Sharp. Uh, this was a visitor from Sharp who was part of the collaboration for a year while he was here as well. These are some of the prototypes of this technology, and this is one of the chips that was developed uh, as a part of this. Now, it's still got a long way to go. It's not done. There are all sorts of issues that these researchers are still struggling with, fundamental basic issues about extracting the information they need from the blood and how they clean this thing and all sorts of other things that are very, very relevant and important. But it's an example of use-inspired basic research, and that's why I selected it. More than 150 faculty in 50-plus departments and their students are participating, as I mentioned, in this particular project. And this headquarters building 
which is going to be situated right here in our college, is critical to the future of this collaboration. Right now, this is, this is a picture of our College of Engineering master plan. All those yellow buildings are ones that are going to be renovated extensively or rebuilt over the next, certainly not in my lifetime, but um, um, so it's a master plan after all. Um, we, are, we are sitting now around about here in the, in the Bechtel uh, uh, Engineering Building and, and part of the plan ultimately, of course, is to replace this with, a, with a, an upgraded building, but of course it would still be uh, the Bechtel Building. In here, we are going to develop a student commons. Our master plan determined that that was critically important to us in the college. We have no social site in the college for our engineers. And so the student commons is going to be in this west terrace here, which is where the demonstrations will be. And the student clubs and societies will be around, not those demonstrations. <laughs> the ones shortly with technology and all that good stuff. Where's Misha? Sorry. Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> Part of the Citrus Building is the first phase of that, which is a cyber cafe that is going to be provided uh, to connect the students through into this uh, part of the master plan. This is the building, just in case you were wondering what we pulled down when you go out and have a look at the pile of dirt there. This is what was pulled down. This was the old Davis North Building, not much of a structure, not particularly useful to us as a college. It was a, it was a good site for this particular uh, building in terms of uh, what we needed to do, and we were able to reaccommodate the research that was going on there. And uh, this is the uh, artist rendition of the building that we're planning to build. Five stories up here of completely discretionary research space. No one gets a permanent office. We bring the faculty together from across the campus. When they leave their building, they lose their office, part of the principle. They come to the Citrus Building. They can stay there for three, five, seven years, and then they go back. And the commitment that department chairs make, just in case we have some here, is um, that you need to provide an office when your faculty member comes back from their stint uh, at Citrus. But it's designed to be flexible space for collaboration. The projects that Rujna has laid out that would fit this are multi-department, ideally multi-college, ideally involving other campuses, and certainly involving collaborations that are across many, many disciplines. And that's the goal for this uh, first phase of our collaborative space in a college. Another very important element of this, critical to us here, is this nano fabrication laboratory. It will be named after the Marvell Semiconductor Corporation, who has given us a generous gift to help us fund this project. And this particular facility will, in fact, be replacing the existing microfabrication facility we have here, doubling its size, upgrading it, and moving from micro to nano. And uh, uh, by the way, that facility even today is used by more than 300 researchers on our campus, only 100 of them in the College of Engineering. The other 200 are already uh, distributed across the campus in other units, particularly physics, uh, Chancellor. Um, so I uh, just want to point that out. Another key, another key uh, element of, of, this, uh, of this building will be a brand new state-of-the-art distance education center. Uh, that's the Bunatau Education Center, and Dado and Maria Bunatau, who are here today, uh, have uh, uh, generously donated the funds we needed to construct that facility. It not only will be situated in the Citrus Building, but it will be connecting to laboratories and classrooms throughout the college, throughout the campus, and with our partnering institutions. All of the instruments we'll be putting in the lab will be put online and made available to high schools, other places to look at. We want to connect ourselves into the community as effectively and efficiently as, as we can uh, through technology and the Internet, through information technology. So, you know, I've given you a once-over lightly and, uh, of, of some of the things that are going on. Of course, the research is going to be out there, and, and, uh, but I hope you can see the potential, what we've already done, but also the potential of this institute in, in, in terms of where it can take us. That one project, Smart Dust, last week the, 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 the advisory board and the faculty were working on what we call the NBTs, the next big things for Citrus. Smart Dust being the first one, and then we're working on the next couple and what those collaborations should be and what we can empower. It's an incredibly important uh, activity to our college and to our campus, as well as to the campuses that are partnering with us. Now, you know, I talked about information, but as you can see from the projects, it's not really about information technology. We're thinking we probably should change the name to innovative technology research in the interest of society because the metaphor we're using and where it's going is much broader than simply information and communications technologies. Now, you know, I can't leave you without talking about our students because critical to this are the students. 
I have one example here of someone who, uh, and I, I could give you a hundred of them, who was inspired not only by the technology, but also by the vision of technology and society. Sometimes it's hard for us as, as people who had that chance maybe 25 years ago to put ourselves in the shoes of the young people that are coming through our campuses now, but I can tell you for a fact, there is no doubt in my mind, that the students coming to Berkeley, both undergraduate and graduate, are really motivated by the concept, the idea of being able to do something that has impact on the quality of people's lives and, and it help improve the quality of people's lives. There's a real resonance, a chord that we've struck there that's important to us in recruiting the very best students to these programs, but it's also important uh, in terms of providing for them the motivation that they need to go into technology and to follow it through into careers. Graduate students, as well as undergraduate students, they're all involved. And so now I'm going to sort of turn, turn just lastly to my role as dean. This is our web page. And so when I look at this selfishly as dean, you know, and I look at our mission statement, which is in the college, which is educating leaders, educating, not training. And we're about leadership in the UC system. We have institutions that lead in terms of their uh, research and education, the people that we pr uh, uh, produce, our product, our graduates. Creating knowledge, you have to be on the leading edge of knowledge creation to be there in that leadership role, we believe, and we, and we live that. And then serving society. As a College of Engineering, a our, 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 our clear responsibility we have is interfacing the technologies that we develop with people and making sure that they're effective. So Citrus is critical, obviously, to our mission, it's, and, and we depend on it greatly. And so um, what I'd like to do now is uh, finish up by, again, thanking you all for coming today. It's going to be a great event out here shortly when we turn the dirt um, and, and get this building going. Of course, from the point of view of all of us in the college uh, who live with this every day, this is a very, very important milestone, and we're glad that you're here to share it with us. And again, apologies to our visiting chancellor, but... <laughs> Thank you. I would be happy to take a few questions quickly if we, if we have a few. Anybody have a question? Yes. Steve. You mentioned about the intellectual property yeah. of the citrus being open to all yeah. participants. Could you comment on uh, how that arrangement would be structured? Is there something coming back for licensing the IP? So, so it's a really important principle. We have the opportunity and the right uh, through our UC system and uh, with our partners, partnering members to, to protect intellectual property if we think it's the right thing to do collectively as a group. The university has agreed in principle to the following model, which is if the faculty agree, if the students agree, if the sponsor agrees, then the university will agree to a priori decide that the results of a particular project will be made available to anyone anywhere in the world, subject, obviously subject to uh, export restrictions, uh, free of charge on a, on a royalty-free, non-exclusive basis. Um, the goal, from our point of view, in making a decision like that is what is the best thing to do in terms of maximizing the impact of our research? We would not have these companies that are committing very large amounts of money back to us to support our research, we don't believe, unless we were open and unless they could see the benefit of the research. So in some situations, many situations in IT, if we license the technology and control it narrowly, actually it's a self-defeating approach. The, the net benefit to the university, not only from the research mission, but also from monetarily, actually, is, is a lot worse than it would otherwise be. That's been our experience for a quarter century. That's the model we're using. Now, there are some technologies, like biotechnology, where a company might have to spend $500 million to take a product to the market. Now, in that case, if you give that technology away for free to anybody who wants it, they're not going to invest that money. They won't do it, because why should they? They're going to spend the $500 million and their competitor can just pick it up and, and uh, manufacture it. So there, an exclusive license is, in fact, the right vehicle to use to maximize the impact of the research. So what we do is we step back and we say, we ask that question, and that's the question that guides us in terms of what we do. And what I'm saying is, so far, in all the work we've done, look at that, that smart dust, look at the impact it's having on the world, Look at the industry that it's creating. That will accrue huge benefit to our research program, to our campus, to our university. And we think that is the right way to work with that technology in terms of maximizing its impact.
Sure. Yeah, John Paul. Can you tell us a little more about budgets? <coughs> Sorry, operating budgets and uh, your intellectual property to use some money? I have to introduce you know John Paul. <laughs> John Paul is uh, is our IBM representative on the uh, on the Citrus uh, Advisory Board. Um, John Paul, you know the operating budget, as you know and I know, is clearly an absolute top priority for us, and 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 certainly President Dines is nodding his head here. So we're looking for we're looking forward to some progress on that. That's the issue here is we need additional funds to keep these institutes going, and I know the president is is actively involved in working on how to solve that problem, not just for us, but for all four of these uh, institutes, and uh, we're all looking forward to, to progress in that direction sometime soon. So the best I can say for now. Yeah, I have to bring my share, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, Jim. Just wanted to say that last week we, we learned that the California Public Utilities Commission is going to put forth a new regulation that requires 10 million smart power meters to be installed in California homes, and we're hoping that our design will be yeah, so that, uh, Jim brings up, it, it, this is a, it's a feedback process. So we, we invent a technology, we create a vision. People see it, they say, well, that's possible. Let's go ahead and build something that, that requires it. And so the California Energy Commission has just required that 10 million um, homes or homes or 10 million meters for 10 million residences need to have this class of technology in them by in about the next eight years. So that's progress there. Yeah. Yes, and and um, how do I do that? Princeton University, Virginia, University of Virginia, uh, University of Florida, all are looking to us for mimicking our viewpoint. And of course, the hundred important institutions. Uh, we have a very strong collaboration with uh, English government. Scottish government came to us, the French, which might be surprised, but So you, I think it's two things I would say, I would add to that. One is, of course, you can never tell, I mean, great minds think alike, and you can never tell whether, when, when you're the reason why something happens, it may be just the right time and the right place. But, um, but certainly, uh, in terms of uh, the thinking here on the campus, we got out ahead of that. One I can definitely tell you that was strongly influenced by us was the Stanford uh, Institute for Energy and the Environment, which uh, suddenly popped up after, uh, after Citrus uh, had... Uh, generated quite a bit of success and enthusiasm and when I talked to the Dean down there off the record he tells me that that was a very key part of the reason why they decided to do that. So these things are going on everywhere. I think I just finished by saying that you know again these institutes are about enabling California industry, bringing the new industries to California so our economy moves forward as much as they are about anything else. While we're, while we're applying the research to these grand challenge societal problems you can see from the technologies like Smart Dust and others that the spin-offs are going to be tremendous and they're going to continue to drive those, uh, those industries forward and that's one of the things that makes us uh, the most proud of what we do. We can both basically do both things, we think, uh, simultaneously and be very successful. So with that, I would uh, thank you all and uh, I think now we're going to move to the groundbreaking which is out and around and there will be people to show you where to go and we'll have, we have a very distinguished group that will help us turn those shovels. So thank you very much.